Hello, my name is Rachel Dean, and I'm Director, Graduate Admission, and Student Engagement for the IIT Institute of Design. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the Spring 2021 Commencement Exercises for the Institute of Design. Our students have thrived in a challenging global pandemic and still have risen to the top. Today, we celebrate our Fall 2020 and our Spring 2021 graduates. First, we'll have an address by our Dean, Dennis Vial. Next, we'll have a celebratory walk from our graduates, followed by a riveting discussion by alumnus Akila Haley, graduates Alpha Huang, and Tommy Collins. Next, we'll share highlights of our end of the year student show, and we'll wrap things up with well wishes and congratulations from alumni, faculty, and staff. Thank you again for joining us today. Dennis, take it away. Dear graduates of academic year 2020-2021, this is not a regular commencement, and I want to clearly mark that. Your time at ID was less about pomp, academic pomp and circumstances and more about your stamina and improvisation. Using an analogy, you signed up and started with a ride along a well-paved road of academic professional graduate program. And third of the way into the journey, your ride mutated into an off-road mountain biking obstacle course. I want to recognize that special achievement. You persevered, you adapted to what was thrown at you, you connected and supported each other, and you achieved your learning objectives with great work, as the end of year of show demonstrates so clearly. I also want to give a shout out to your faculty and our staff that so nimbly and determined supported you during this off-trail by parkour. They too went off-trail completely restaging their course formats delivery and reinventing our community events and support and our talks and panels. Our sincerest thanks to our stellar and committed faculty and staff. To summarize in mountain bike language, we all together shredded the gnars, this means difficult sections. No one bonked, that means running out of energy, or bailed, means jumping off the bike. We all cleaned it. No crashing, stopping, or taking your feet off the pedals. So getting back to more the academic experience, how has you been wondering and reflecting on how this experience has shaped and changed your professional development at ID? I think that like many other trends, the pandemic has further accelerated important and needed shifts in the practice of design. Right at the beginning of the pandemic, Professor Carlos Teixeira shifted the topic of a sustainable system seminar to design for pandemics. And to quote him, his goal was to frame the pandemic from a design perspective so that the students could quickly adapt their thinking to something new and unprecedented in their lifetimes, end of quote. The team researched how different countries integrated and adapted existing systems to respond to the challenges of the pandemic from ranging from testing, grocery delivery, remote patient monitoring, and contract tracing. They identified dominant challenges and resulting principles for design of systems in today's world that the pandemic has even brought even more to the forefront. The first one is that we live in growing uncertainty. Uncertainty requires solutions that are adaptive, that can fit to multiple contexts and change over time. They need to be designed to be adaptable and responsive to changing dynamics. So as you move into your practice, remember to always design in for change. Second, we are living in time of unprecedented diversity. So moving forward in your practice, make sure that you always design with that broad range of stakeholders to deliver on that need for diversity. And third, which was not in the report because it happened post uh, the workshop, the challenge 
of the unjust and unsustainable inequity we are faced with in our society and many societies around the world. Anti-racist design, a work led by our professor Chris Rudd, focuses on identifying these existing biases in systems that create that inequity. So moving forward in your practice, remember to design out bias and inequity. So I want you, as you graduate, to leave with those three memorable principles as you get on your way. Always design in, with, and out. Design in change, design with all stakeholders, and design out inequity. And now it's my privilege to announce the time to meet the class of 2021 as they walk on stage to be awarded their degree.
this year was very challenging for all of us. Um, I can only imagine what it's been like to try to finish school, uh, prepare for your life after ID. Uh, can you tell me what your greatest challenge has been uh, during this final year and what do you think it, how it's prepared you for your future? Yeah, so um, I want to say like my final year is basically remote online. So when I first come to ID to this beautiful um, building, I basically just stay here every day, like from nine to nine, basically every day. Even if I'm not having class, but I just like being here so that I have um, opportunity to talk to more people. So like students always walking around as well as professors. So, and sometimes we just gather in those uh, community area. And I really like the atmosphere that I don't have to be very intentional, but as we are moving online, I think the biggest challenge for me is to how I can engage with other people to not be like totally intentional, but in order to like help each other to go through this disruption um, period. So, I think it really helped me to move forward to the future because the world is always changing and as designer we really need to be like adaptive and we are a community. So even if we are not like together in a physical world, I think it's still really uh, useful that you be open and proactive and reach out when you need help and offer help when you could. So that's the biggest learning for me from this year. What about you? I would say there were two big challenges for me. Uh, the first one was um, figuring out how to stay connected as well. Um, as much as I'm an introvert, I realized like who I am as like a person requires me to like be engaged with others. So it's like, how can I do that in this like virtual context? So it took a lot of trial and error in the beginning to figure it out. And then the other was um, the pandemic really revealed that I had really poor self-care um, <laughs> habits. Um, cause I would literally, cause like my room, first and foremost, is just like super small. So it's like <laughs> my desk is right near my bed. So it's like shower, eat, and then I'm right at my desk. And so it was like, there wasn't a way to differentiate between like work and rest. So really being intentional, like going for walks or like trying to do like a staycation, like I did a staycation maybe, um, a month ago, just like, I was like, I need, I was like, dad, I love you, but I need a break. Like, um, prioritizing what's most important for us is really important because there is always too much for you yes. to do. <laughs> for sure. Yes. And everything seems like important, but like you should know like what matters to you the most. So, I mean, when I'm talking to my folks on like right now, we always like try to remember and talk about like what the time is was like when we were in Kaplan uh, Institute and we're just like so um, how to say that we love that a lot and I wonder for you Akila when you look back at your time in ID what made you smile the most? The part that makes me smile the most first is the relationships with people. Um, meeting people who I know that I might not have met if I hadn't gone to ID. Uh, learning from them, their lives, their experiences, their cultures, um, that really shaped my perspective of the world and just kind of like my worldview. Uh, and the other piece of it for me is, you know, what happened during that time at ID. And for me, it was like a fundamental shift where I decided and knew that I no longer wanted to design objects I wanted to design experiences. And for me, those experiences were about you know, making a better world and in turn a better future. And all of that was you know, kind of shaped by the coursework and the research and the intersection of that with those experiences with people. And you know, I think a lot about um, the great novelist like Alice Walker who talks about you know, the, the present that you're constructing should essentially represent the future that you're dreaming. Mm -hmm. And I see that quote having so much uh, meaning and connection to all of those experiences that I had at ID. 
that still lives with me today. Uh. To build on that, so who you were before your ID journey and who you are now may vary minimally or like very explicitly. Um, what are those changes? Um, what are some of those changes that you've, that you've noticed um, and are you pleased with some of them? Um, you know, who I was then and who I am now, I feel like there's, you know, there's the core that's still the same. Like there's the core that is um, centered around compassion for others, uh, making a difference in the world, like fostering space for creativity, um, you know, continuously wanting to learn. But what I feel that's changed the most is a sense of urgency. Um, urgency to make a difference. Um, you know, I feel like my intolerance for injustice and inequities has become more urgent. Um, I think that those are much more pronounced just based off of living. You know, you, you have your own lived experiences, you learn from others, uh, you witness loved ones having their own lived experiences, and it, it sharpens your lens. And for me, like, sharpening your lens is a part of growth. Like, we should always be in that space of growth. And so that's where I feel like, you know, who I was then is at the core of who I am now, just a more amplified version. Mm -hmm. You know, thinking about all of the experiences at ID, um, what do you want to be, like, the defining factors of, of your careers and, and your futures? You know, and alongside that, like what equates uh, success uh, for you in those paths? Yeah, um, Tommy, do you want to go first? <laughs> I think for me, um, well, one thing in particular, um, I was very vocal about it, that I am the only black student native to Chicago in the program right now. Um, and I think that's definitely an area of improvement that ID um, and I think IIT as a whole can can work on the fact that we are situated in a predominantly black community and that the residents don't see this as like an option to attend school um, we need to change that um, I think that um, representation is so important so for me in my career I want to amplify representation in as many spaces as possible um, because when you see yourself the dream evolves from a dream to becoming something tangible. So uh, I always say that I've been in um, the ivory tower most of my time and I really love being a student because being a student can enable you to ask questions even if it, it is like stupid question you say and to think differently and make mistakes, be able to experience. So I think it's really important if I'm like, when I'm developing my career, still be true to myself and ask questions when I see one and be able to be reflect like what makes you want to be a designer in the first place. Segwaying into my question for you, Akila, um, and I think I kind of have an uh, idea of what your answer is going to be based on what you said earlier, um, but I'm going to ask anyway. Uh, do you find it necessary to separate your identity from your work? Um, and if so, why? Um, and if you don't, then how does your identity um, inform and move the work that you do forward? Um, you know, I feel as if I always carried pride in my identity, um, but I can vividly recall uh, being an undergraduate student and I was told um, that I should not list my name, Akila, in my portfolio submissions. And I was told that pretty directly um, and it came from a space of the person was acknowledging that there, the potential for a lack of trust and belief of qualification because of my racial identity and gender identity. I, at the time, was going by A. Williams on all of my work. And, you know, it was saddening 
because that person was right, I noticed a shift in my applications. And it stayed with me for a while. I internalized a lot of that. And then eventually I kind of got to a place, again, like more lived experience. And I got to a place where I realized that I no longer uh, would choose to silence who I am. Thank you, Alpha, uh, for sharing so many uh, stories of your experiences as well as your aspirations and your perspective. I appreciate the time and I also appreciate your thoughtful questions. Thank you so much, Akila and Tommy, about like all the insightful questions and sharing with me the experience, your time in ID and what you love and what challenge that you're facing. And um, yeah, and thank you, ID, for having us to join this insightful and meaningful conversation here. Uh, first of all, I also want to say thank you for taking time out to have this very candid and transparent conversation with us. Um, like we were talking about earlier, representation is so awesome to have alum come back and share um, not just their success, but like being able to say like, I started off here and this is where I am now and you're thriving um, in your career as you see, as you define success, which I think is so important. And thank you, Tommy, for sharing your stories, your perspective, uh, your experiences, and the very thoughtful questions. Um, I appreciate both of you, your, your energy and, and holding space with me here today, so thank you. Good morning, ID. As I sought inspiration for this speech, it would have been nice to get the full ID vibe one last time. You know, and even though I'm recording this speech from Kaplan, you and I know it's not the same here. But while the pandemic denied me this one last walk down memory lane, I still would like to start with a story. It's a little anecdote that illustrates what ID has fundamentally done for me and will open up some reflections about how we might carry the best of ID into our careers. Almost three years and what feels a lifetime ago, it was week four of the semester and I was young and green. It was Product Design Friday at the old downtown campus. In a few hours, Marty, our professor, would take us out for beers at Dugan's on South Halstead. However, at that moment, I couldn't think about happy hour. I was emotionally preoccupied, mortified, really. On a table at the front of the room lay 21 foam core models of a desktop printer, one for each student. We had spent the whole week in the, shop, in the shop, surrounded by the paraphernalia of foam core modeling. Think X-Acto knives, glue guns, various kinds of power saws. Some of us had stayed in the studio until midnight the night before, bending, gluing, joining planks to construct our replicas. It was a lot of hard work to execute what seemed like a very arbitrary assignment. Anyway, Marty, he was picking the foam core printers up, sort of one by one, he was kind of inspecting them, holding them to the light, scrutinizing them. They look good, he was saying. Then he came to mine. Oh, he said. I shifted in my seat. Something was wrong. At that moment, I realized it. I had placed the wraparound piece the one that formed the main body of the printer, backwards. The join, which was supposed to be hidden at the back of the printer, was in the front, garishly staring back at me. A pit opened up in my stomach. I felt my heart rate speed up. The blood drained from my face. It was horrible. I felt like I was falling into a black hole. This design school thing was not going well. No way I was getting beers that night. The whole thing might seem trivial now, but you have to understand this was foundation. And the incident triggered a whole chain of thoughts that was really typical during that year. Why did I leave behind my old career? Yes, it was soul sucking, it was boring, but at least I was good at it. And here I was piling up sleep debt, glue burns, just to make a printer out of foam, and I was sucking at it. But then interrupting the spiral of self-criticism, Marty gave a little chuckle, as he examined my backwards printer. With his bemused half smile, he said, every year, there's always somebody. 
there's always somebody. What Marty was communicating to me was that everything was okay. That I wasn't alone in my mistake, that failure didn't signal a lapse in Marty's care for me as a student or a person, and that trying and failing was better than not trying in the first place. Three years later, it's hilariously clear that my entire biophysical and emotional response was totally out of proportion. Today, I would have laughed it off and gotten beers at Dugan's. I probably would have had an extra one. But that's also kind of the point. At that mundane moment on a Friday afternoon in October 2018, the ID system was being applied to me. My counterproductive emotional response was not simply indicative of a character flaw. It was the product of my previous professional culture and its failure to prepare me for ambiguity and challenge. ID does not sell a cheap and easy creativity. Its superpower is to hybridize and hyphenate its people. We come as engineers, architects, business folks, theologians in my case, but we leave as engineer-designers, architect-designers, business folks-designers, a theologian-designer, whatever that is. ID doesn't erase our unique set of skills, experiences, and quirks. Rather, it embraces them, equips them, and amplifies them. It adds the dash designer to our personal identity. I'm convinced that this phrase, dash designer, signifies something intangible, almost spiritual. It's what proves that we're a mindset school, not a method school. And I'd like to highlight three qualities that I think get to the essence of this dash designer mindset. The first is being water. If design is the discipline of giving the proper form to an artifact, then we designers have to be formless, like water. As Bruce Lee says, do not be assertive, but adjust to the object, and you shall find a way around it or through it. Be water, my friend. It's way easier, though, to perform our self-brands rather than to put in the work of continuously building them. As designer Annika Izora says, if your actions are not ongoing, they're a performance, not a practice. So whatever we might post on LinkedIn or claim of ourselves through our portfolios, we nonetheless have to take pride in being water, listening, building self-awareness and competence until we find it's our time to flow in and through and around a problem. But water doesn't just flow. It also crashes. Embedded injustices require us to crash. We crash when we speak up, when we vote with our labor, when we censor not only humans, but the highest humanizing values, solidarity, sustainability, equity. Secondly is being vulnerable to a problem. It requires a kind of psychological vulnerability to exist inside a problem to inhabit that space between the is, which we deal with in research, and the will be, which has to do with implementation. It's not easy to stumble around the intermediate should be. It feels very uncomfortable and exposed, but it's also where we have to go again and again, whether pausing to sketch, rewriting the problem statement, moving the sticky notes, or sticky notes around, or maybe just walking away and having a drink, like having a glass of red wine. Rather than giving in to the anxiety to simply have an answer and be done with it, let's make ourselves vulnerable and allow the problem to drive us a little insane. Whatever comes out on the other side will be better for it, always. Lastly is being humble. When I was applying to ID, maybe many of you felt this way, but I remember observing the fanfare around design thinking, design thinking. And designers seem to have this stuff of genius. They're smooth, confident, disruptive. Oh, what a word, disrupt. Who doesn't want to be disruptive? And it certainly was an attractive narrative. But of course, we know this narrative is self-serving. The more complex the problems, the more cooperative and inclusive the solutions need to be. What if we saw ourselves as contributors rather than solvers? What if our hard-earned skills and design powers rather than returning acclaim and attention to ourselves, consistently and intentionally enrich the ecosystems and people with whom we worked. Being water, being vulnerable, being humble, 
I believe these qualities are indispensable as we launch our careers becoming design leaders in an era defined by its crises. We are emerging into the midst of them, and we will play a role, however small, in determining their future. But when I say that ID taught me these intangible qualities, I don't refer only to faculty or courses, though they were wonderful. I refer to this entire community of committed, talented, and inspiring human beings, my colleagues. During our time here, Students rebuilt the entire student government. We've stubbornly maintained our culture amidst 14 months of distributed work. Think of the Humans of ID Slack channel or the end of year show, which is now about to be staged for the second time remotely. We've built anti-racist pop-ups and student advising toolkits, international food fests, and yes, Chicago's hottest Japanese breakfast startup. Our student community simmers with hard work, creative optimism and dedication to purpose, both individual and collective. And so my fellow Dash designers, congratulations on persisting to the end of this journey. Congratulations on the moments when Marty's comment, there's always somebody, applied to you and you didn't give up. Congratulations especially on persevering through those moments you didn't feel competent. Through those moments where you felt unseen, unheard, not validated, through moments of trauma or personal struggle, which have touched many of us in the past year, especially our black colleagues and community members. Today, however, we celebrate. We've made it to the end, and so let's raise a glass to everyone who helped us to get here, family and loved ones, faculty and staff, Zoom dogs and Zoom cats, Miro, the IIT 711, and especially though, our beloved friends and colleagues who have accompanied us and taken care of us through the weirdest and hardest 14 months of the century. As we depart ID for the next chapter in our journeys, I wish you the clarity of a Tomoko diagram, the joy of a Sari facilitation, and the care and fellowship of a night out at Dugan's. Thank you.